The expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline system clearly was about gaining global access for Canadian crude production, for our customers, for our shippers, for the Canadian oil sector. Right from the beginning, we were going to approach this project in a very, what I might call, non-traditional way. We were going to go into communities first, learn what their issues and concerns were, appreciate the impacts the project was going to have on communities, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and start with a white sheet of paper. We have seen regulatory changes come throughout the life of the project and in particular I think the regulators are really considering how public and Indigenous input is added into decision-making processes across the country. The first thing I told them when they come out to me is now what you're going to do for us is about what we're going to do together. They come out and had a lot of meetings with uh, different people to how to understand what they were there, what role they were going to play in it. He wanted to know more about the environmental issues and the cultural issues to understand, and he wanted to listen to more leadership to understand how to work with them and to have a better idea on how to build a relationship to understand so we can build trust and understandings of how we're going to go forward. For us to be successful, we were going to have to listen to every voice and no voice was going to go unheard. We were going to take the input from communities that we touch, from individuals that are affected by the project, that we're going to stay true to our high road principles. And that's been the legacy that we've continued throughout the project, is listening to local impacts, local people, not always agreeing, but going into every coffee shop or longhouse or board table or chief and council office in order to hear and learn so the project could be built in a way to both minimize impacts and maximize opportunities. The District of Clearwater incorporated in December of 2007 and with the project going through it has really helped the vision of our council and our community which has always been to have the four pillars of uh, sustainable growth. Trans Mountain has provided the funding to expand our sewer system and the septic, expand our water system. It's created fire flow and several things like that that building code requires. One of the other things that we've been looking at and a vision that we've always had is to bring our young back to our community. So they graduate in small town Clearwater. They leave, they get educated and they have a family, but they don't come back because they didn't have jobs to come back to. Well, now they've got jobs to come back to because the community's starting to grow. I let them know that when you come through here, I said, you guys are going to come and work and you're going to be gone tomorrow, but our people are still here. Then we start putting the right people together to work together to understand how to sit down making sure the things that we're going to go ahead the way they're supposed to. Environmentally, the cultural end of things, like letting them know that there are some places inside the valley here that were um, things that were put away that couldn't be touched and our people understood where they were. So they developed monitors to make sure these things were going to happen. Indigenous monitors are an active part of the environmental team at Trans Mountain. We bring an Aboriginal eye to everything that happens on the project from environmental monitoring to construction monitoring. We're here to make sure that number one, the environment is taken care of and that any cultural or any um, historical or any land use is done in a respectful manner. I believe that Trans Mountain is building a bridge right now between construction companies and Indigenous communities and I believe that it just is setting a high standard for the future. Because of the level of scrutiny we have, because of the level of oversight we have, and because of our ongoing desire to always do the right thing, we have put in place all sorts of mitigation measures from, you know, two sets of bubble curtains on our piling rigs in the ocean to committing to moving ant hills you know, along the pipeline right of way to save a food source for species at risk. And so I think we have really advanced understanding from an environmental standpoint as well in terms of how the effects of these projects can be reduced. 
Canada's become a world leader, especially in uh, reducing the impacts of shipping on endangered species because of the science and research community that's come together in British Columbia, largely as a result of the project. There has been so much innovation on aspects of safety management, uh, technology, and specifically around tanker safety and also reducing impacts from shipping. And I anticipate that that innovation in technology and operational effectiveness will continue globally for years to come and will drive change faster than had the project not started it. We have shown that these projects can be built responsibly and respectfully, and I hope that other proponents try and follow in that same path. The easy part is doing the engineering and the design and the construction. The hard part is doing it in such a way that the communities you're touching, the people whose lives that you're affecting, uh, uh, can see the value in what you're doing, can see the benefit in what we're doing, and will believe in us leaving those places better than we found them. I do believe that the promises that they made to our people, they will follow through. If I didn't trust them, they wouldn't be there.